Uh, before we go to the customer development, I want to talk about what Brant and I call uh, uh, the innovation spectrum. And this is an image from our new book. And um, if you look at the left here, where the little, the little man is sailing a sailboat, and the waters get progressively rougher as he goes to the right. And what we're trying to show there, that innovation is a spectrum. And on the, the one pole on the left side is what we call sustaining innovation. And the right side is disruptive innovation. And they're radically different. They, again, they exist on a spectrum uh, here from left to right, but they're, but they're radically different type of beasts. The, the, and the really the, the bright line between them, the, the fundamental dividing factor between them is that one, um, things like uh, the customer, the channels, the value proposition, uh, the product itself, um, the price, all these things are relatively well understood in a sustaining innovation type of uh, model. So this is when a big company takes an existing product and improves it upon some dimension. So let's say I have this cup here. You guys can see the cup. Let's say this cup, uh, you know, uh, uh, can uh, it can be modified to to have more coffee in it. Uh, it keeps the coffee warmer, et cetera, et cetera. That's an example of sustaining innovation. Um, on the other side, again, disruptive innovation is when the problem uh, is not well understood. Uh, when you have to uh, when you enter a new market. Um, and the customer doesn't know. The market's unpredictable, and this is where the traditional business methods tend to fail. Um, this is a high uncertainty region. And the reason this is important is twofold. One is there's a fundamental difference between um, the difference uh, between these markets, and two, how you approach them in terms of lean startup like techniques or customer development are radically different. Generally speaking, if you're doing the sustaining innovation, generally speaking, you can take your customers' uh, words at face value uh, they, because they have a good understanding of the problem. There's a lot of context. In disruptive innovation, you, it's, you should be very skeptical about what potential customers say. There's not a lot of co context. And there, you can have to do a lot more type of testing that involves behavior um, versus what people actually say. So what people actually do versus what they actually say. And if I were an entrepreneur, I am an entrepreneur, I would, I would figure out where I am on the spectrum. Um, where, uh, where I am on the spectrum, which helps me determine what sort of approach to take. Um, does that make sense? Any questions so far? Let's move on. So next slide, where are we? So uh, I'll go quickly past the side, but what, what something Brett and I think about a lot is customer segmentation. And, and market segmentation is a very, very um, um, uh, powerful, it's a lot of lo what we call low-hanging fruit. Most entrepreneurs don't do this at all. The sooner you do it as an entrepreneur, um, especially if you're doing something innovative, the better off you are. This is the difference between uh, life and death for a lot of startups. And the, the, a, a, I'd like you guys to think about segment, not as a demographic group or a demographic characterization. I'd like you to think about segments as a group of people who share a, the same pain and reference each other uh, in, uh, in context to this pain. Okay? And it's different than just simply saying, um, okay, you know, who are your customers? And then you say, oh, okay, it's, um, it's Entrepreneurs who are 25 to 35 that live in Bangalore uh, and uh, like to program in .NET. That's, that's a characterization, but doesn't tell you too much about their pain. And you and and it's our contention that if you're going to be doing something uh, uh, innovative as an early stage startup, the sooner you understand a market segment around pain that's unified around pain, the better it will, better your customer development efforts will be. Because some people take customer development to be I will simply go out to the market and speak to 100 different people. Well, if those 100 different people aren't actually in your segment, in your market segments, then you wasted time and you actually haven't been uh, lean, you haven't learned anything. And worse than that, if you try to average their suggestions or their input for a product, uh, you're going to get this Frankensteinian product that, that, that is no, nothing to no one and uh, doesn't please any particular segment. Um, so, question is, can you give an example? Um, 
uh, what's a good, what would be a good example of this? Uh, so, I mean, there's many examples. I have friends who, who have startups and, you know, they had an idea for something interesting. Let's say, um, um, what's a good example off the top of my head? I don't, I, for example, I had a friend of mine, he had a, uh, he had a, um, he wanted to build a better Twitter tool. And um, I asked him, you know, what is, uh, what is this market, who are, who, who are his customers for this, this tool for Twitter? And it was this tool that, you know, you can manage your followers and, and, and following and, and all this hashtag stuff. So like another Echo Phone or, or, or Tweet Deck or something like this. He replied to me, uh, everyone is a customer. Anybody who uses Twitter uh, will want my product. And this is clearly, clearly, clearly untrue. Because if you are a celebrity and you have a million, two million, three million followers, you use diff Twitter very differently than, uh, let's say, I do. I think I have like 4,000 followers. And the pain, the depth of pain is very different. I don't actually have a big pain around Twitter. Uh, so I can just use any free product. But if you're a celebrity and you want to maximize your followers because you're going to monetize your followers, you look at Twitter and the opportunities afforded to you by Twitter very differently. And ergo, since you look at it differently than the average person, you can have a need for different tools. Okay, that's a very simple example. Um, and this is, this, this is, there's thousands of examples like this. But again, this is a cute little picture here, and it's sort of cute and fun. Uh, it's, it's, it's an image from our new book. But, the, but there really is a deeper story here. The deeper story is that you should think around pain, right? In this case, people with square heads versus uh, demographic information. Demographic information can be useful, uh, but is not uh, uh, is not something I would hang your hat on. So how to do this? Here's what I would think about. If you're early stage, I would think about a few segments. So start maybe three segments and figure out what is the depth of pain around their problem. So let's say in this example, we could have segment A. Let's say you're building a network security product. Segment A could be an IT manager, uh, and segment uh, B could be the CTO. They both have pain around uh, network security, but they solve it very differently. Okay, and this is key to understand. Uh, the, the, so that a, a IT manager is often tasked with actually implementing a patch, and the CTO uh, has to evaluate a solution, find budget for it, and then report to the CEO on uh, its performance. Right? So generally speaking, they have different levels of pain. Uh, they have different budgets. Um, uh, the market, in this case, let's assume the market size is, is the same. Uh, in the, and let's just assume, this, this is a fun example, that, that to create an MVP for a network, uh, for an IT manager is probably easier than a, than a, than a, um, than a CTO. Um, and let's just say I, I used to be an IT manager. So I know these people, I know how to reach them. I can convert them online for some amount of money, say 50 US dollars. And I really like them. My values are, I think they're great people. I like serving that market. I understand who they are. And segment B, again, I could take the same product, uh, tune it also to, to the CTOs, let's say, they have bigger budget. Um, the, the market size is a little different. Let's say it's the same size, but the sales cycle here is longer. Ergo, I'm gonna charge more as well. Uh, and because I, I don't have a lot of contacts here, um, my, the, the, uh, it's harder for me to reach these folks. So you can actually score these different segments here and figure out who you want to, who you want to attack first. And some of these are, 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 these are all at some level a, a subjective. So depth of pain, that's, you can, it's going to take your customer development efforts to figure out how much pain do they actually have? Are they trying to solve this now? Are they spending money now? Are they, um, thinking about this now? Is this a subject that they talk about in their meetings? Uh, again, size of the budget, that should be pretty easy to understand. Um, and how easily can you reach them? And then, of course, values. This is where you're, you marry your vision to the product uh, and to the solution, where do you like serving these people? And if not, uh, uh, can you avoid serving these people? This lets you, and then taking this, now, and then once you have your segments figured out, Go back to the market and do customer development and look at what do the IT managers say in this case, what do the CTO says, uh, say, and then take that input and uh, align it with the segment. Does it make sense? So a uh, gentleman here, or I'm not sure a gentleman, Nambujan says, uh, is asking, so it's basically market summation based on pain. Uh, 
Exactly. Well, so I, I would say all market segmentation is really actually based on pain or passion, right? So if you're doing market segmentation by demographics, you're probably doing it wrong. And this is a this is actually interesting. This is actually a known problem. Back in 1940s, people were writing about this. In the 1940s, were saying it doesn't look like demographic information is actually very good for segmentation. This is 1942. I, I don't have the exact quote, but I can find it for you guys. So. Generally speaking, the, the, the better, best entrepreneurs, best marketers have been doing this around pain or passion. It's, it's the same thing, really. Um, uh, and you, in that way, you get a much, much clearer understanding. And, and let me actually, uh, there's something else we should actually add here, and it's not on this chart. There's something I call an anti segment. An anti segment is something very interesting. An anti segment often superficially looks very similar to one of your segments. So they may, if they're a company, they may have the same uh, revenue characteristics, uh, uh, number of employees, and superficially uh, look very, very similar, but don't have the same depth of pain. A lot of startups get in trouble because they don't recognize the difference between a segment and an anti-segment. Where they look at these superficial characteristics, and then what happens, they go out and serve them they go out and, and, and um, so, let me, so the, someone's asking for example of an anti-segment. Let me, let me give you a, a real life example. So a friend of mine is uh, working on a um, iPad application. It's actually an HTML5 based application that allows recipes and allows restaurants to do food costing. Uh, and there's a certain class of restaurants and a certain type of uh, owner that is very driven by financial metrics. So the, uh, uh, they have pain around managing their inventory and making sure that, let's say, for example, I buy a certain type of fish at $20 a pound on Monday, and the next day I buy it for $50 a pound. I have to adjust the recipes. Does that make sense? So because if I, if I don't adjust the recipe or I don't adjust the cost, I'm not going to make any money on it. So my friend of mine has this great uh, uh, application. It's, it's great. And uh, uh, there's all sorts of companies that are very interested in it and are paying for it. And he then uh, I asked him as well, who's you know who's going to use your product? And he said everyone. And this is this is often the answer. It's never right. Um, the the he went to a a, a um, we did this segmentation exercise and very quick, quickly figured out that number of employees, uh, revenue per restaurant, location of restaurant were not very good indicators if people would buy the, 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 the product or not because he quickly ran into uh, two types of anti-segments. That's people would have the same uh, uh, revenue per year, same number of employees, same sort of superficial characters. And so one of these were, was what we called a... Um, what we called, uh, I forget the name, exact name of the, uh, the segment. We had a kind of a cute name for it, but uh, this was typically a person who ran a restaurant in, here in the United States um, who's already paid uh, for his uh, children's education. He's uh, already paid for his home. He's uh, heading into retirement, and he's not overly concerned about financial metrics. One year he makes, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. Next year he makes a little bit less. Um, he's not, doesn't have a lot of variance uh, in terms of his food costs, and even if he does, he doesn't really uh, pass it on to his customers. He likes hanging out with his customers. This person would never pay $100, $200, $300 a month for my friend's product, even though his restaurant may make the same amount of money and may employ the same number of people uh, and may even serve the same type of food uh, as these other restaurants who would. Another example we found was what we call the ethnic collective, where this would be, for example, the United States, let's say a Chinese restaurant where again, the, the, clearly it's a, um, a profit-making enterprise, but you don't see as much variation in, uh, in food costs. Uh, they use slightly different supplier networks, and the, the goal of the restaurant is just as much to keep everyone in the family employed as it is to make money. And therefore, um, uh, they are unlikely to be adopters of my friend's technology. Does that make sense? Any questions there? So uh, happy to explain. So let's see. Ajay Kumar says we have cloud-based financial accounting software targeting small medium enterprise in India as of now. We're thinking of segmenting demographically. What's your thought on it? Um, so I, again, I, I would urge I would urge you to think about. So number one is 
the, the term you're looking for is firmographic. When you target, um, when you target businesses, you look at firmographic information. I would urge you to go deeper than that. I think firmographic information is is, is certainly helpful, uh, but again, I would go deeper than that and figure out who in the uh, the company is buying this uh, and what sort of what pain. Especially when you're when you're targeting um, companies, you always have an involved sales cycle. You always have multiple influencers. Uh, you have people who could um, sabotage the deal at any moment. Uh, and it's really early stage, finding early adopters, and it's more around pain or passion. Um, and so I would, I would urge you to do that. Um, so we talked about anti segments disruptive. Any questions on this slide on the, the sustaining versus disruptive? Does anyone have any additional questions? No? Doesn't look like it? Um, we talked about this, we talked about this. Well, this, that was it. I wanted to do just a really quick hit presentation for you guys uh, and not get overly, overly, uh, overly involved, but want to see if I could answer any questions, help you guys out with anything. No, nothing? Let's see here. Let's see, we have some questions. Um, okay, great. So a, few, a few good questions here. So what's a resegmented niche? Let's start with that one. And how does segmentation differ in between sustaining? Great, great question. All right, here we go. So let's talk about these ones. So here again, we have the spectrum. The little sailboat on the left is this, this gentleman is representative of, of sustaining innovation. Um, and then the, 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 gentle, the little guy on the right who's surfing this big wave, that's our disruptive innovation. Again, think of this as a, as a, spa, a spectrum. And in, in between, we have these points. Uh, one is resegmented low cost, resegmented niche, rippling innovation. So let's just concentrate on resegmented low cost. So this is when you take um, some product and you make it very low cost. So often freemium gets into here. You take it very low cost and then you find a new you find a new uh, uh, segment for it. Okay. So you already have the product. You you've decided that you're going to uh, increase performance on cost effectively. And you, you have to go find a new segment. Uh, niche is similar in that you will go take this, take a similar product and just find a new niche, uh, a, a new niche for it, a new segment for it that will that will like this product. And and arguably, this could be argued both ways. In, in, uncertainty increases over to the right. Uh, I don't want to get into rippling innovation. That's that's um, uh, that is uh, something Brant, my co-author, knows a little bit more about than me. Um, so it's in Murti Iranki says, any examples for disruptive innovation? Disruptive innovation generally is something that has, is, is game-changing innovation. It's, it's so where it really reshapes the, um, the, the context around it. So in the United States in, in the early 1900s, the introduction of the Model T uh, was, uh, was definitely disruptive innovation. Um, the iPhone, when it first came out, um, uh, the iPhone, when it first came out, was uh, uh, disruptive innovation. Right now, one of the reasons, you know, the iPhone 5 just came out here in the United States. I think one of the reasons some people are very angry is now the iPhone 5 is doing sustaining innovation, um, and it's uh, and people expect it to be disruptive every single time. Um, what else is disruptive? I think the iPad was very disruptive uh, back in the late 1800s. The telegraph um, was a very disruptive innovation, sort of reshaped the world. Um, things like that. Let's see. How does segmentation differ in between sustaining and disruptive innovation? So, great question. I would always argue that I think you're better segmenting around uh, pain or passion, especially on the disruptive side. If that's where you need early adopters. That's where there's no data and you have to go out and manufacture data effectively in disruptive. So that's why you, you segment around the early adopters who have pain. Sustaining innovation, again, those things are known, generally speaking, the d demographic, firmographic information offers a little bit more value there. It tends to be known. It may point you in the right direction. I still am not a big fan of it, uh, but it's much more about what's known and, and over here. Um, let's see. Once we've had a, so great question. So once we identify the segment, how do we identify the market size of the segment? So this is actually a really interesting question because here's something that fundamentally happens here. In sustaining innovation, you can take a look at the existing data, look at existing market data, and actually do some market sizing that's somewhat reasonable. 
if you're doing disruptive innovation, you fundamentally, you're, you fundamentally don't know the size of the market. Uh, and if someone asks you to size a market for disruptive innovation, it's, it, it's pretty much useless. You, you fundamentally don't know. Uh, and uh, something to think about, and because often some of these really disruptive ideas look very simple and stupid at first, and then create massive markets. Uh, let's see. Facebook is disruptive. Yeah, I think I think Facebook um, at at one time was very disruptive. Let's see here. All disruptive innovation sometimes becomes sustaining. Absolutely, that's a great that's a great point. So once you get product market fit here in disruptive innovation, you actually start sliding down to sustaining innovation. This wave pushes you down this way because. Um, um, uh, and this happens time and time again. This happens with the Model T. This happens with the the iPhone. All these things, all what these new markets start to mature, the product life cycle starts to mature, and you be, it becomes slides right into sustaining innovation. Um, see, iPod with iTunes is disruptive. But yep, I think at, at one time it certainly was. Um, so does does, that, does this innovation spectrum help sort of frame some of the thoughts about how to go about doing customer development? Does, does this help? Any more questions? Because if not, actually, I have to uh, I have to go and uh, prepare for my day. Uh, but hopefully, I was uh, a question. The last question: Isn't spectrum made of more than three things? Absolutely. This is a spectrum. Absolutely. No, no th I, I, this is just this helpful um, uh, device to help think about it. But this again this is a spectrum. There's probably infinite little areas here. And again, it goes from uh, risk. Let's say high risk, uh, risk, 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 and then right around here, let's just say. It turns into uncertainty. And the difference between uncertainty and risk is risk you can probably measure. Uncertainty is, uh, by definition, un unmeasurable. And again, this is a spectrum. Um, uh, and uh, it is a spectrum. So, so this is just a way to think about Patrick, it. Don't, don't think question. this is. Uh, this doesn't necessarily reflect the real world. Into five segments. Um, what is a good see, practice? Is so there a proven method that gives better, quicker results of getting feedback on disruptive innovation? Uh, you know, it's a good question, Prasad. Um, I I don't know I don't know if you call customer development proven or not. Uh, some people would say it's not. Some people will say it's it is. Um, uh, I'm certainly a fan of customer development. There's many examples of people who have done it. Uh, customer development like things, uh, and until there's sort of a better option, I think that's only our only option. So I would I would I would take a customer development like approach on these type of things. Um, and really try to frame these uh, in those sorts of questions. Hopefully that helps. Any more? I got one more minute, and then I actually do have to go. Any more questions? Sure. Uh, let's say we have segmented uh, into five segments. What is a good practice? Should we start marketing to all the segments, or should we experiment one after the other? Great question. So uh, the no, so number one, if you do this early stage, remember let's say let's say it doesn't matter if you have three or five. Uh, it doesn't matter. The point is this: one is just because you've done a segmentation exercise doesn't mean that the real world actually reflects what you think, right? And so you should use getting out of the building to uh, validate or invalidate that the segmentation that your understanding of the segmentation of the segment actually reflects reality. And this should be an iterative iterative process, right? So that's number one. So this is an iterative process. Your understanding of the segment betters every time you talk to a customer. And does that make sense? Um, the the uh, that's number one. And then two is is I would think about is how do these how do these segments relate to each other? How are they unified? What, what and again this goes back to this matrix uh, and your resources. How who can you reach out to first that can get you a foothold and get you cash if that's what you need? Or what have you? I don't think I, I, I personally. I don't think I would. I would. I would um, uh, market to five different segments right away unless the product is very, 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 very similar and and acquisition methods are similar. I would probably do, maybe do three. My my co-author Brant, um, he likes to recommend seventy percent of resources in one segment, twenty percent in another segment, and then ten percent sort of opportunistically. But you have to watch out for the anti-segment. You don't want to start getting down the path with someone who wastes your time uh, and, 
and doesn't help you um, uh, uh, further your business. So you have to watch out for that. Hopefully that was helpful. Uh, even for the innovators and early adopters, is the segmentation necessary? Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. You could absolutely necessary. That and that's really where it's shot. Absolutely, because then you can really again the early adopters. You can have multiple types of early adopters, and their pain and the quality of their pain will vary around their problem. And so you have to then you make a choice. If let's say you come across two or three, who do you want to uh, who do you want to actually fulfill? Who do you whose problems do you want to solve? You can't solve everyone's problems. Um, and that's a good problem to have. If you have two or three different groups looking for your solution, that's a great problem to have. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, hopefully that was helpful. And uh, I, will, uh, I will send, uh, um, I'll send you guys a link about a uh, segmentation called uh, Milkshake Marketing written by a, a man named Clayton Christensen, a very fascinating uh, Way of looking at the world, and, and he follows the the he's invented something called the jobs to be done model, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of it. I'll I'll send it, and uh, I recommend everyone read that.